I'd like to introduce uh, Senator West. John, thank you. John, thank you very much. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, I have to rush through this today because I have a trial. I'm a lawyer also, so I've got to practice law. I've got a trial starting at 1.30. Ladies and gentlemen, of the jury. <laughs> so I have a trial starting, so I've got to get down there. I wanted to make certain that I came here today. This is my first stop in terms of visiting all of the chambers before the legislative session. Uh, I was here uh, last spring, I think, John, uh, last spring, and I told you that I would be making uh, trips back here to make certain I informed you in terms of what's going on. We're getting ready to go into the next legislative session. And the question is, is what's going to be on the table? Dallas County Schools is going to be on the table. Um, there'll be issues concerning trans transgender bathrooms on the table. There'll be issues concerning school finance on the table. Property tax caps on the table. And that's going to be against a backdrop of about a five to, I think, ten billion dollar shortfall in revenues during this particular interim that we're in. And that's because of falling gas prices, oil prices rather, and also the reduction in sales taxes during this interim. And so obviously there's going to be a tightening of the belt. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor, the Governor, and the Speaker has asked agencies to cut back and frankly to go to zero budgeting again, which is always a good deal to do. You, have, all, you should be doing zero budgeting based on uh, developing your model and your request in order to get a budget doing this next fiscal year. We're, we're looking at issues concerning the teacher retirement system. How many teachers, or former teachers, do we have here? I'm working for you. I'm, I just want to let you know that I'm working for you. The fact is this, there's, there's about a, a $1.35 billion uh, shortfall mm. over the next biennium that we're going to need in our teacher retirement system. $1.35 billion. And so it would behoove the teachers to make certain that you're voting for people that have your interests at heart. I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. Now, for me, I'm a Democrat. I'll just put it like that, all right? DPS, Department of Public Safety, is asking for additional millions of dollars for border security, all right? I understand they want to help build the wall. <laughs> you didn't find that funny, did you? Okay, all right. But the reality is, is that they're asking for additional dollars in order to secure the secure the border, even though we gave them, what, Clifford, about $800 million last session in order to uh, take care of that issue. They're asking for additional dollars. You see, the fact is, is that we are having to tighten our belts, but the reality is, is that there are dollars available to, to do the things that we prioritize as a state. In addition to that, there's going to be substantial turnover just in the Senate alone. We're having Kevin Eltide and um, at least two other Republican senators. They have left the Senate, so there'll be some new senators coming in. We have one Democratic senator, my colleague Bradley Ellis, is leaving, and he's going to become the county commissioner in Harris County because of the time of Franco Lee, who was the county commissioner there for a long time. And then there's several people in terms of in the House that are leaving. There'll be new uh, chairmen of various committees in the House that they'll need to come up to speed in terms of what their responsibilities are. So there'll be a lot of turnover during this next session that we're going to have to kind of make certain we put it together, stabilize the legislature, and move forward. And what normally happens is this. What normally happens is that the Senate always organizes first. And we organize and begin our business first. It, the House takes a long time because there's more persons in the House. There's 150 in the House, and there's 31 of us in the Senate. And so it just takes longer to get things done in the House. And so we will probably look at about 6,000 bills, and some of those will shake out and, and pass, others won't. 
you know, we lost a longtime steward in the House who was kind of the part of the conscience of the House, Sylvester Turner. Sylvester is now the mayor of Houston, but when Sylvester got in the well, what would happen, Gunner, is that he'd get there and everybody would, even in, in the Senate, we'd kind of see what Sylvester's going to say. Uh, because he got there and he began, he's, he, he was real slow, John, in terms of his cadence. And then all of a sudden, Rick, he would start shaking his head like a Baptist preacher. And he'd go, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. But he would be missed. You know, as it relates to priorities next session, this is what I want to ask you about. John mentioned, I believe, if we look at what's been going on across America as it relates to the relationship between law enforcement and ethnic minority communities, we know that there's an issue. There's an issue that just occurred in Tulsa last week. Yes. And, you know, we don't know all of the facts, but what they're showing on television leads, I had pause in terms of what actually occurred and obviously needs to be investigated. Here's what I'm thinking about. My history is passing racial profiling laws, passing transparency laws as it relates to dash cameras and police cars, establishing uh, body camera programs in the state of Texas, giving money for those programs to local units of government. And I'm going to go back and try to get some additional dollars forward, figure out what we, else we need to do with the body camera program. But that's just part of it. Obviously, we know what happened in our city uh, this past summer. And it wasn't about our police department because I think that we have one of the model police departments in the entire country. It was about the relationship of law enforcement with the ethnic minority community. That's what it was about. And we can continue to see that play out over and over again across this country. Something must be done about it. We begin to see also that a lot of these instances are around traffic stops. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. You have a traffic stop and something goes wrong and all of a sudden you end up having a death of them or someone getting injured. I was really taken back by the commentary of, I think it was one of the police in his helicopter in Tulsa, saying he, he's a big, bad dude or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. How the hell are you going to know he's a big, bad dude? Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, that's profiling. That's profiling. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether you're white, black, brown, purple, pink. How do you know who this person is? First thing, oh, at least what was purportedly, but what I heard them said, and I don't know the context, is that he's a big, bad dude. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that if someone sees me, I must be a big, bad dude. Without knowing anything about me. profile. Here's what I propose to do. And I want your feedback on this. And this is not a, something that's going to cure everything that's happening. But I think it's a step in the right direction. How many of you have your driver's license? Driver's license. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. I mean, everyone took your driver's test, right? Right? Okay. Because if you didn't, I need to know about that. <laughs> How many of you use the driver's license manual in order to study? Driver's license manual to study. Some of y'all did. Time ago. They didn't have one when I was okay. got mine. <laughs> I'm setting. I'm, I'm trying to get. I'm, set, I'm establishing a predicate. This is what I'm about to tell you. This is what I propose. I propose that we look at the driver's license manual and define in the manual the expectation of a citizen and law enforcement doing a traffic stop. What do y'all think? Absolutely. Okay. Now, towards that particular end, it may not, I may not need legislation to do it, but not only do I think we should define it in the driver's license manual, I think that we put the content in the driver's license manual and that an applicant as part of the driver's license test is tested on the expectation. That's good. Does that make sense? Make a lot of sense. Okay. Now, what I did towards that particular end is that last week I convened in Austin stakeholders from civil rights organizations to <coughs> law enforcement to the Texas Rifle Association to begin that discussion. Now we have a task force in place that is going to make some recommendations to me that I'll recommend to DPS in order to include in the driver's license demand. But we shouldn't stop there. 
we should make certain whatever those recommendations are, that we take them and we put them in our schools, okay? And it should be made, you know, we, we always talk about STARS, we talk about TEKS, Texas Central Skills, Texas Central Knowledge and Skills. I think that as part of the uh, history or government, or whatever the case may be, that we need to embed that in the TEKS at some point where it makes sense, whether probably in high school or middle school or whatever the case may be. But I'm going to be asking the educators to take the content that we develop through this task force and put it in our schools also. And then I'm also going to be asking uh, the agency of the police departments to take it and make certain it's a part of the academy, the training for police officers also. Does that make sense? Make a lot of sense. Okay. And so I'm going to tell you something that came up. How many of you have ever been on a dark road and had the police turn their lights on to get you to stop? How did you feel? Yeah. How did you feel? Who else has done that? Afraid? Afraid? Afraid. So what do you do? Do you stop? You don't know what to do, right? But your basic instincts say, say stop, right? right? And so the question is, and this was brought up by the uh, executive director of the Texas Rifle Association. She says, what am I supposed to do? Because all of us have seen on television those horror movies and all that other stuff. <laughs> or we've heard of instances where someone is stopped by someone other than a police officer and we know what happened. What should you do? Move to the light. Call 911. That's it, all over the place. Mm -hmm. But we need to define that. We need to define those type of circumstances in the driver's license manual to tell you exactly what you need to do. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be dealing with. It just makes sense to make certain that we define what we need to do when you are interacting with a police officer doing the stop, a traffic stop. And I think that we will hopefully see a reduction in traffic stops going back as a result of doing something like it. So I'm, I'm going to spend my, I'm going to spend some of my time during the legislative session making certain that we get that type of legislation passed. And I think it should be done around the country also. Okay? Yes. Now, as it relates to issues concerning schools, well, how many of you think that the transgender issue should be at the top of our legislative priority list? Come on, y'all. It should be, should be at the top of it? Why? Well, I'm a middle school principal. Yeah. Would you stand up, please? Y'all say hello to our middle school principal. And introduce yourself. I'm Latonya Lockhart, principal of Global Academy, formerly John B. Hood. Y'all say hello. 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 <laughs> I, I think that it should, because I do think that there's some uh, sense making that needs to take place and some clarity uh, that needs to happen, not only for the uh, students, but for the educators as well. Um, I think that with a lot of what's going on um, on the news and through uh, social media and things like that, there are several misconceptions out there. And so uh, we do need to bring that about. We do need to make sure that we're educating everyone um, to, to the, the purest form of the issue. And, um, and that we're all working together to build some next steps so that we can do the right thing for the students. Okay. Now, how many of you think that should be done at the state level as opposed to at the local level? Should the school district be responsible for that, or should the state be responsible for it? <laughs> so the state? So all of y'all believe that the state needs to take that issue up? Yes. Yeah. All right. Good. All right, some do, some don't. Who don't believe the state should take it up? Okay. Please stand up. So y'all making this easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> Your name is? Chris Johnson. Chris Johnson. Y'all say hello to Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey, Chris. Okay, Chris, why not? I think we have more important things to, to do, um, hmm. and especially, you know, for, for the children, like CPS, number one. But what concerns me, I mean, look at North Carolina. They're suffering a lot of economic impact, I guess you could say. The NCAA pulled their, all their events, the NBA pulled their events, concerts are being canceled. 
Uh, PayPal is not setting up. I knew I think they were going to put something there. They're suffering a big economic impact too, and I don't know why you have to have a law for that. Okay. I, I, you know, so how many are agree with Chris? How many do you disagree with? Him? And what? Yeah, please stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Your name is? Hi, I'm Brittany Farr. Y'all say hello to Brittany. Hi, Brittany. Brittany. The only reason I would disagree is because there's such a discrepancy in the, in the school districts here in the state that I feel like some states, some districts would do what's right by the children and some would not. And so if it's going to be taken up, it should be done at a uniform level. But I don't agree. I, your original preference was, should it be one of the top priorities? It's not one of the top priorities in the state, but if it is going to be taken up, then it should be uniform across the state. Okay. One more. Thing. Any other thoughts about that? Larry, you have some thoughts. Which one? I'm Larry Duncan. That's a little Larry Duncan. Larry. <laughs> I'm just concerned whenever the legislature takes something up. Uniformity would be good, but I have more faith in, in local, not present company notwithstanding. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're saying there. <laughs> <laughs> right, here's another question. Uber and Lyft. In Austin, Texas, there was a referendum on Carlos whether or not the city could pass an ordinance or doing background checks, right? It was passed, background checks were required, and Uber and Lyft decided to leave the city. Should there be, should cities have the ability to determine whether or not companies such as that should conduct background checks of their drivers before putting them out on the street based on public safety? Yes. Yes. Should the state interfere with that? Yes. Should there be uniformity in the state? Yes. So y'all want? I thought all, I thought government closer to the people was best for the people. <laughs> but you think they should be a uniform? They should be uniformity in that law throughout the yes. state. Yes. Taxi, taxi services that uniform with the state, or is that by local? And I don't know the answer to the question. I think it's local. It's local, Larry. It's local. It's local. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so the question is whether or not Uber and Lyft should be regulated by the state. Yes. Your name is? Darrell Quigley. Y'all say hello to Darrell. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, Senator, but in, the, in Dallas County, the only city that regulates transportation for hire is the city of Dallas. That's taxes, buses, limos, ambulance service. And I've been in the ambulance business here in Dallas for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. I can take my ambulance service and run in any other city in Dallas County without any permits or without any scrutiny, except for the city of Dallas. And I always wondered how come Uber or Lyft could come in with a horde of vehicles with nobody that has taken a look to see if these people even have a driver's license and conduct business and unfairly compete with those people who have to pay fees, go through inspections. I mean, that's, I mean I'm, I'm kind of concerned about this. I see. Anywhere in the state of Houston is the only city in that part of the state that regulates transportation for hire, San Antonio. San Antonio, but you're, you're bigger urban, urban city. If you go to Garland or Richardson or, um, doesn't happen. Well, that's going to be an issue during the next legislative session, I can tell you that now. And it's not like it's a, a big <coughs> issue, but it is an issue. Let me talk about foster care. If I had to take, you've allowed me to serve as your senator for some 23 years, 20, 24 years now. In fact, I was reminded, I went, to, but I think it was the last session, I was at a CPS function and I was speaking. And this college student, probably about 20 years <coughs> old, got up to introduce me. Rick, mm -hmm. and she says, uh, I'd like to introduce to some and present to others Senator Royce West, who's been serving over two decades, okay? That put it all in perspective. Wow. And I'm still having a great time. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm still having a great time to get things done. <laughs> but if I had to look at my whole legislative career and the bills that I'm most proud of is, and the area of work is in the area of child protective services, okay? There was a time in Texas where only foster parents were given subsidies to take care of kids.
kids. And all of us know the tragedies and some of the good stories and bad stories as it relates to foster care. For those that don't, uh, when kids aged out of foster care, they had no real relationship with their families. And so we saw them out on the streets, we saw them in our jails, et cetera, et cetera. You name it, you saw foster kids. And so what I did several sessions ago was set up a kinship program. And frankly, uh, working with uh, Ann, uh, uh, Tim Kane's wife, Ann Morton, Morton I think is what I was um, she was working on some things at the federal level, and as a result of federal legislation was passed, I was able to set up a program here in Texas. And the program essentially was, if we had a child that was taken by the state, and there was a family member who would frankly adopt that child, then the state would provide a similar subsidy as they would someone in foster care, a parent in foster care. And guess what? The results are better. When we're looking at doing a longitudinal analysis of the, uh, and doing a, doing a longitudinal comparative analysis of foster care versus those kinship care, uh, permanence care programs, you get better results of permanency care because you have that biological, you have that blood relationship, and those kids get an opportunity to be with their extended family, over the, obviously for the rest of their life. So we're going to continue to work on those programs because if you look at our foster care system here in Dallas, you look at the high turnover rate that we have in foster care throughout the state of Texas, and we had an epidemic here in Dallas in terms of the, the high turnover rate. And part of it is because of the monies that we're paying. Uh, these young people that come out that have high caseloads, and they recognize high caseloads, high anxieties, and really no real life because they're on call 24 hours a day. And so we need to make sure we, we're looking at that also. Public Education, we talked about trans, we talked about transgenders. Public school finance. <laughs> Many of us thought that the Supreme Court was going to do the right thing and declare the way that we fund public schools in the state of Texas unconstitutional. Nope, they didn't. They said it's not our business, and guess what? We're going to stay out of it. The judiciary is going to stay out of it. And so it's now squarely in the hands of the legislature in terms of how we fund public schools. In the area of public schools, we're going to have issues concerning choice, issue, vouchers. <clears throat> how many of you for vouchers? Raise your hands. Vouchers? Why? Gunner, why, why are you for vouchers? <clears throat> well, I'm just putting you a friendly room. Um, <laughs> uh, Democrat, by the way, for vouchers. Uh, <laughs> I think the free market is a good thing the end of the day, and uh, if we can have choice for families uh, that have never had a choice before, um, I would be interested to see kind of the financial ramifications of a choice program, of a voucher program in a state like Texas, a state that's basically a country, it's huge, um, and there might be a financial case to be made against vouchers, but from what I've studied and seen in Florida, Ohio, Arizona, and states like that, it's really a minuscule amount of money that ends up going to a private school for students that, for the most part, are in extreme poverty. Should, let me answer this. Sure. Should vouchers be limited to a certain population, or should they just be generally approved? No, I would say limited. And who should they be limited to? Well, there's a couple of factors that you'd have to look at. I think socioeconomic um, ability uh, would be one of the things, and how you measure socioeconomic ability, uh, capacity, is there's a lot of different factors that you can look at. Um, you, you take into example, do you, do you factor in debt that a family might have? Um, do you factor in uh, the fact that uh, the grandmother's living in the household, things like that. Um, how do you measure that, and how do you create something that's fair? It's tough. Should it, be, should it be made available? Should vouchers be made available to middle and upper class uh, households? No. Okay. Okay. Any other? Who's against vouchers? Uh oh. Oh, so we have some fun. <laughs> Pastor Crawford? Yeah. Would you stand up? <laughs> would you introduce yourself, first of all? You have to introduce yourself. I'm Reverend Elder Crawford, Pastor Pleasant Mountain United Methodist Church here at Pleasant Road. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Say hello to Pastor. <laughs> hello, Pastor. session with your interests at home. This is not my office. You've allowed me to be your senator for these many years. And I don't feel no waste time, okay? But this is what I'll tell you. It is important that the chamber is involved in the process. And how do you get involved in the process? Number one, it would be great if you have a legislative agenda that you share with me. And in having that legislative agenda, I want you to take into consideration the political times and the political atmosphere that I find myself going into and in the state of Texas. So let's be realistic in terms of what the agenda is. And when you put together the agenda, make certain that you are consulting other chambers. And also be prepared, John, to have the membership come down and support it. Now, you don't have to just come down and support it. Because of technology, there are other ways to do it. I'll give you an example. I was uh, arguing with uh, the former Commissioner of Agriculture, he was a senator at the time, and we, we were talking about minority businesses, and both of us were sitting on the Finance Committee, and I'm, I'm, I was a, obviously a proponent for it. He didn't know, he was equivocating. Well, I don't know whether we need to do this or we need to do that. I said, well, son, I'm going to help you. Make up your mind. And so what we ended up doing, we had people from across the state of Texas <coughs> calling him the next morning on a continuous basis. <laughs> we had people faxing him. That's when fax machines would have them. We, <laughs> we had people faxing him on a continuous basis. In other words, nobody else could get in to his office other than the people that had a strong feeling about this issue that sided with me. And so when he came back to the finance committee, he said, Senator, I've made up my mind, and I, now I do understand. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that understanding was as a result of political action from people throughout the state of Texas. So it's not necessarily for you to be there, but it's necessary for you to participate in some form or fashion that can ultimately be designed by the leadership of the chamber. Let me stop and answer. I've got about five, ten minutes at the most to answer any questions that you have. Yes, ma'am. Senator, one thing that you didn't address and I'm very concerned about is first-generation college students is the talk of tuition set-asides being taken away. As you may know, they go mostly towards first-generation college graduates, and here we are at Eastfield Community College. So could you talk a little bit about what your strategy is to combat any legislation that might get rid of tuition set-asides? And let me talk about it in, in the broad context of financial aid, okay? Uh, I've sat on the Higher Education Committee and Finance Committee for most of my legislative career and have been the architect of many of those programs, one of which I was a co-sponsor of that particular program. There is a move afoot in order to um, repeal that particular program. And the question becomes is whether or not they have the, the votes to do it. But there's a move for right now to do it with the top 10% law also, okay? 
and uh, several other financial aid programs that benefit people with low and socioeconomic status. Now, I, I'm not going to go down there and try to make the black argument. That ain't going to work. I'm not going to go, oh, that's right, you're not, you're not going to go. <laughs> I'm not going down there to make the racial argument. The argument I've got to make is that these programs benefit students in the rural and urban areas and put together a rural and urban coalition to make certain that we can try to beat back any effort to repeal it. That's the only way it's going to work, okay? Because it's not a black-white issue, it's a resource issue. And I, I hopefully I'm going to be able to show on, on a longitudinal basis that these particular programs that we've implemented have helped rural students as much as they've helped urban students, and then do a campaign to uh, go into the radio stations of these different markets around the state of Texas and see can we get the superintendents on and get them to be supportive of these set-aside programs in terms of the tuition set-aside programs that benefit students of low economic status. So that's, that's I just told you all my strategy. Oh, I'm going to tell everybody what I'm planning on doing. So that's how I'm going to address that issue. Other questions? No other questions? Yes, ma'am. I, I want to make certain that you know also that, what's the date of it? Okay. On the 29th of September, and we have some flyers. We have, uh, we, we have D23 goes to work. And this is my effort to make certain that we provide employment opportunities for people living in the 23rd Senatorial District as well as people living across North Central Texas. And we've been very successful. We have, what, more employers. That we've run out of space for employers, right? Yeah, our, our goal is to get 85. I think we're probably about at 90. 192, 93. Yes, sir. You're talking to me. Can you stand up? I'm sorry. Our goal was 85 employers, and now we have um, we had more employers to register, so we kind of opened it up a little bit to a couple of other employers. We have about 92, 93 employers um, at this time. And so now our, our job is to get the word out to the job seekers. We want the job seekers to come in and influx and overcrowd the employers and let them know that we, they still need employment. So that, that is our job. And so I brought some flyers today. I also sent the flyers out to the chamber so they can get them out to everyone and, and um, also the um, council secretaries and everything so they can get them out to the community. And so we'd ask you to use your network, your, uh, your mailing list, and try to get it out to the churches, and try to get it out to as many individuals or organizations as possible because we've got over 90 employers that are willing to accept applications and hire people. And so if someone sits up and asks the uh, if I'm running in a contested election, I'm not going to go ahead and, um, and do that. If someone asks me, well, what are you doing about employment in your district? But this is what I'm doing about it, OK? I'm trying to provide opportunities for people who want a job to get a job. And we also have the Dr. M. J. Conrad program. How many of you have heard of that, Dr. M. J. Conrad program? Not enough, OK? Uh, we've had this program for over, what, 20 years now? At least and 20. At least yeah. 20, 24 years. And over 2,000 students from the senatorial district have, have been able to get some employment opportunities as a result. <coughs> and so we've got to make certain that that word gets out because uh, we're coming up in December, I think, or the, or the October is when the uh, applications process starts for that particular program, and they will be <coughs> interviewed during the uh, fall break in, in December. And so. Again, employment program, D23 goes to, goes to work. Yeah, yeah, Senator, would you talk a little bit about workforce uh, training a little bit? I know Casey Thomas and I on the council are very interested in that. We think it's very close to economic development, you know, because if you got money, then you can help <laughs> develop the economy economically. And we, we need more of that. We need more money in the state to be effective in these uh, inner cities. And we're kind of sure whether that is the state, I think it's federal government because of restrictions that have been placed on it. In fact, I was in Austin last week at a meeting, and we were talking about workforce and some of the restrictions that have been placed on it. And in fact, the, um, uh, if you are interested in attending a meeting that I'm having with the commissioner, I, I, I'd welcome your input into that. Okay, just give them a click and I'll make sure. I know there is a matching program that you guys made, but you've got an RFP going out to do just that. If you put up 500000 a state of match, if you put up a million, the state will do that. Money may come from the feds. Well, but see, here's the problem. And like during summer, 
we're trying to hire students, and if you you got to meet a certain profile, economic profile. <coughs> well, when I was coming through, and maybe I met that profile then uh, when I was in high school, uh, we, we had summer jobs. In fact, the mayor's summer job is something that I initiated when Tom Leppard who got in the office. I said, hey, listen, you need to put this back in. But when I was coming through high school, I worked with, with the Texas Department of Transportation during the summertime. Uh, I worked with LTV. I got a summer job. And you know, obviously, you know, if, if they're working, if kids are working, they're making their own little money. And they're staying out of trouble. And those are the types of things that we need to do. But the federal government has a, has a cap in terms of the amount of money that your family can make in order to be eligible for those types of programs. And so we need to have a federal initiative in order to see whether or not we can get that amended so we can have additional dollars to push through to the cities, uh, the workforce commissions, uh, to put the money out in order to get additional jobs. Let's talk turkey. I look forward to it. Um, any other questions? I can take one more. It's Sheriff been a couple. Somebody. Just a comment about your, your the transgender. You know, every school that we have here in Texas has got more than one bathroom. I don't understand why it's so complicated, why they can't just designate one for, for transgender. Because, <clears throat> I mean, what we have to recognize is the reason a lot of these kids want a bathroom designated is because they're uh, assaulted and tormented by other children, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the problem's not going to go away. Uh, and it, what, the last thing that we want to do, and I know that the, the, the rate for suicide is high amongst these children that are confused about their gender or, or are in the process of change. So. You know, I don't, I, you know, any, any, any family can have a transi transitional child or a transgender child. And I think that um, it's an important issue to Okay. Because we don't want to lose any of these kids. Oh, no, I understand. I, that was a story on uh, ABC this morning. I didn't know that uh, uh, Magic Johnson uh -huh. had a uh, son that uh, um, had decided to have women, uh, women tendencies. Yeah. I didn't know that until this morning. Yeah. Any others? Senator, real quick, what are your thoughts on Fair Park and the plan that's been proposed? Well, good, good question. Um, I'm still not satisfied. This a couple of weeks ago, we had a uh, summit over at Paul Quinn, and I was able to have the mayor, Don Williams, Walt Newman, John Wild Price, and Harry Robinson's delegate that, that I designated. Um, I'm concerned about the footprint. Uh, I'm concerned about the direction. Let, let, me, let, me add, let me ask this question. How many of you believe that 345 should be torn down? How many of you know where 345 is? How many of you believe that it should be torn down? Okay, how many of you believe that we need to make sure we maintain 345? Either sink it down or the ground. Well, and, and here's the deal. <coughs> I can tell you now that I'm opposed, adamantly opposed to tearing down 345 because I know the history of it. Okay? And if we don't have 345, then there won't be any direct north south with uh, connection. All right, so I'm against it. Um, as it relates to its relationship to Fair Park. I understand that there's a move afoot to try to go from Fair Park over to North of 30 and to tear down 345. That, that's how <coughs> so you connect all of that together. Okay? Now, I'm not opposed to development at all, but I am opposed to 345 being knocked down. As it relates to the specific project in the park, both plans have merit. I'm trying to figure out whether or not the city council is going to be able to come up with some sort of solution. I can tell you that there's strong opposition to the Walt Newman plan uh, in the community. There's strong opposition. I get calls on a regular basis concerning that. Um, and I get calls on a lot of things. And so there's got to be a way in order to have both sides, all the sides come together come up with what's going to be the best solution for the entire city. Do we need economic development in the area? Yes, we do. But the reality
reality is, people talk about gentrification, most of the land has already been flipped. Developers own a lot of the land around Fair Park right now. And so there's merit to the argument, why is it that the city allows communities to become blighted with no, no um, investment, and then developers come in and get the necessary infrastructure development necessary in order to reinvigorate the communities. It's an argument that goes back to <coughs> Thomas Hall over there in short north Dallas in terms of the blighted areas that were over there. Now it's hard to even buy anything over there because of the investments that have been made by government and also by private development. And so as we look at, as we look at Fair Park, we need to make certain that lessons learned in the past or that the lessons that we've learned from the past, we don't repeat them as we go through this particular process with Fair Park. I, I, you know, obviously I'm not on the city council, it's my senatorial district, and I will be weighing in appropriately when I think I need to weigh in on. Okay? Well, yes, sir. I'm going to ask you, are you doing anything to help people get out and vote? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, please. Without question. Yeah, please. Make, uh, I'll, I'll, all of you know uh, the, importance of, uh, the, the importance of this election, whether you're voting Democrat, uh, Democrat, or Democrat. <laughs> it's been a pleasure being here with you. I look forward to seeing you.